Hello, and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. The second day of public impeachment hearings is behind us. Former ambassador to Ukraine Marie Yovanovitch testified about the events that led to President Trump removing her from her post as ambassador to Ukraine. She talked about the importance of the Foreign Service and Rudy Giuliani's smear campaign that preceded her removal. Republicans questioned why she was giving testimony at all, since she was not the ambassador during the time that Trump asked Ukraine to investigate the Bidens and the 2016 election. And then Trump, for his part, tweeted about Yovanovitch demeaning her during the testimony. So let's discuss what all went down and what the two arguments, line of arguments were from Democrats and Republicans. Here with me to do that are senior politics writer, Clem Malone. How's it going? It's good, Galen. Another big day of hearings. Been yeah. sitting by the TV love, all day. Love watching TV all day, though it has a very different valence as an adult political reporter. <laughs> that is true. And also with us is senior writer Perry Bacon Jr. How's it going, Perry? I'm doing great, guys. All right. So let's get right to it. Claire, what was your top line takeaway from the day of testimony? Well, I think for starters, Marie Yovanovitch, uh, like the the two diplomats that that testified earlier this week, is a was a um, a pretty good witness for the Democrats. I think she had, um, I think, what is it as is at the baseline a pretty relatable story, which is um, she was removed from you know her job and a long career that had led to it. Um, although I should say she's still at the State Department, but she was removed from the job. She felt very unjustly um, on false premises, which the State Department knew about, but still went ahead with her removal at uh, Trump's behest. And um, I think she was, you know, she she didn't necessarily always take the bait on partisan questions. Sometimes I think her answers were, were kind of um, clipped, but I think she presented sort of a sympathetic face to the idea that Rudy Giuliani was behind an effort to uh, remove her from her post for, for sort of um, out there reasons having to do with a um, a conspiracy theory. Yeah. Perry, what was your takeaway from the day? You know, in some ways, she was the second day witness, not the first day witness, but chronologically, it was sort of interesting to listen to because in some ways you had to, you would have made more sense, um, not dramatically, obviously, but in some ways, chronologically, to have the person who was removed in this kind of weird way testify first. And then, because she sort of laid out this, you know, in great detail, I was the ambassador, I was pretty good at it, I had good experience, I had lots of credentials. There was this weird process in which I was removed. And then, of course, Mr. Taylor replaced her. And then he kind of witnessed the quid pro quo and the more, and the more uh, nefarious things. It was interesting to watch her in that she's not a witness to much of actually what is going to be the fundamental impeachment, I think. But I do think she goes to the fact that they had a very unusual Ukraine policy that involved removing someone as an ambassador who, who I think testified pretty well to having been very credentialed for that job if the job was representing the U.S. and Ukraine in a traditional way. Yeah. But I mean, the Republican response both in those hearings and then in the Twitterverse, kind of the rapid response team was something like, you can't be impeached for hurting somebody's feelings, right? And the right. president has full range to appoint or remove an ambassador as they wish. And it was kind of like, all right, so why are you here? And also, by the way, Marie Ivanovich, sorry that you're being used as a pawn in these Democrats' impeachment push. I mean, was that an effective... Was that the honest truth? Like, was that just the situation that she was put in? I think Yovanovitch will be effective if if all goes to, according to Democrats plan of, of how this is received in painting sort of this um, in setting the scene in 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 letting people in on the atmosphere that existed in Ukraine and in the Ukraine foreign policy making channel with the Trump administration which was to say it was weird right and that it was being um, basically led by the president's personal lawyer, right? This is she's kind of a prelude to Giuliani and the Giuliani adjacent people, right? So, um, you know, it goes to f foreign interference in in U.S. affairs. It goes to was Giuliani improperly um, leaning on certain Ukrainian channels in order to get this much talked about political dirt. I mean, she she is more kind of setting up the picture. She sort of, you know, to to Perry's point earlier. Taylor 
kind of started us in media's race, right? With, with the with the testimony on um, on Wednesday, he kind of said, "This is this is the central fact of what was happening." And now we go back in time <laughs> to Marie Yovanovitch, and we get a little more context for the story as it unfolds. Right, because she was not the ambassador during this period of time right. that we're talking about. So, what argument, kind of general argument, cliff notes for the day, were Democrats making through their questions and through their staff attorneys' questions? I think the broader argument was this: this um, taking this ambassador, removing her from her post, was part of a broader series of acts by the Trump administration that suggest the Ukraine policy was not about. It was not about like you know anything to do with Ukraine itself and improving Ukraine, but really to tr- help Trump with his reelection by by uh, get, remove her and then getting in and then having Sondland and other people involved with the policy who would be more willing to implement this um, aid for investigations trade essentially. Essentially, I think the, the in other words, she was here mainly. To, she was here to demonstrate that they had they had this great ambassador, so we had to remove her to get the scheme going. That was kind of the core argument. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. I mean, I think a lot of what came across both in the recounting of what happened to Maria Ivanovich, but also in her talking about basically the State Department under Trump was sort of this revelation of the the transactionary way that Trump thinks about foreign policy. So, Ukraine owes him something, therefore they must do political favors to him. Uh, it kind of is is in line with how he thinks of something like NATO, right? He always says the U.S. pays more than any other country to NATO, and like those NATO members owe us, then they they owe back pay, right? Well, the the point of the NATO alliance is its foundation, right, to kind of promote this originally this kind of pro-Western anti-communist. Uh, we need to reduce the spheres of influence. Um, it's a it's an organization that's not about just dues paying, right? It has a greater um, effect, and I think you see a microcosm in this Ukraine, this whole Ukraine affair of the transactional nature that the Trump administration has approached foreign policy with, and I think that obviously comes from the top. And so, when Mick Mulvaney stood in front of the the stood at the the White House podium and said, "Yes, deal with it. Politics or domestic politics are gonna have on have an effect in foreign policy making," while that might have been a banal statement for him as someone who works in the Trump White House, for many people who, who are involved in foreign policy making for State Department employees, that was alarming because I think the hallmark of American foreign policy has typically been you want to try to make sure that countries generally have a sense that what the United States is saying from administration to administration, whether or not be Democratic or Republican, is that there is a ultimate shared goal in policy making that those groups have, that the country might be, yes, different parties, but when it faces the rest of the world, it has some kind of united vision. And and that seems to be breaking down here. And you see quite a public display here. And it's also been fundamentally true, right? For decades from Republican to Democratic administration, the foreign policy goals have been relatively bipartisan. And in some ways, as a result of that, we haven't necessarily realized how much authority the president has to do as he wishes when it comes to foreign policy. Because, you know, the president doesn't have to rely on Congress for a lot of things that he wants to do with regard to other nations. It's just more obvious when it's a a goal that is not shared across parties, perhaps. Yeah. And I think, I mean, not to go, not to go too far down the garden path with, with foreign policy, but I think, you know, the Iran deal and the Paris Cl- Pl- Climate Accord two big Obama administration foreign policy things, Republicans reversing them, right? Like there's a, there's a sort of flip-flopping, I think, that makes that has made the rest of the world nervous about the commitment of the United States on these certain things, right? And, and um, you know, the, the ability for, for a pre- one president and then another to renege on a, on a, uh, a deal is actually kind of damaging to the credibility of the country's, you know, ability to to broker those deals in the future. And you mentioned not going too far down the path of, you know, the foreign service and foreign policy. But Yovanovitch did spend a lot of time Mm -hmm. in her opening remarks talking about the significance of the foreign service and basically making an argument for why we have the foreign service. And, you know, I made a joke, I think, on Wednesday, like if somebody 
fell asleep 30 years ago when the Berlin Wall fell and kind of woke up today, they would be very shocked to find that it almost seemed partisan for a Foreign Service member to be like making the foreign policy arguments of Reaganism and George H.W. W. Bush's presidency kind of while giving testimony against a current Republican president. Um, anyway, side note on foreign policy. But so, Perry, we laid out what the Democrats' argument was. How did Republicans try to respond to all of that? You know, I wasn't left thinking that they had a sort of a clear-cut response because her credentials were such that I think, and the narrative she told was somewhat hard to dispute, like the facts that she got recalled from Ukraine in this sort of odd way. So they didn't really dispute her core facts or her narrative. I mean, I think one thing they said, as you indicated, which is that removing the ambassador is not an impeachable offense. That's not a great argument because the Democrats are not going to have an article of impeachment that says she was removed. It'll be a much broader case. But the main argument was, you're a great ambassador. You're fine. This is not really... They were sort of focused on other things. I mean, they they focus on the whistleblower and how he's not being able to testify, how he or she is not testifying. So I didn't think the Republicans spent a lot of time trying to rebut um, the ambassador. It was more saying that she wasn't involved in the core decisions, one, and the removal of her itself was not impeachable too. They also got into Hunter Biden, right? When Republicans, yeah. p- particularly Representative Elise Stefanik, who I think he was arguably the most effective questioner on the Republican side, was asking questions about even when you were preparing to be sworn in as yeah. ambassador, you were prepared to be asked questions about Hunter Biden's role. I thought that was a very uh, effective line of questioning on Stefanik's part and 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 frankly the most effective um Republican line in general I think as far as far as the battle goes to win public opinion to their side right the idea of uh the legal form of corruption which is nepotism is pretty what is pretty much what's nakedly on display with Hunter Biden having a board seat for Burisma which he has now um resigned from over the I think in the past month um, so, yes, her pointing out that the Obama administration was aware that Hunter Biden had this had this seat. And, you know, both the Bidens say that that Hunter Biden and his father never discussed Ukraine. Fine. But obviously the administration was aware of the uh, the appearance of impropriety. George Kent spoke to that on Wednesday. Um, and, and I think Elise Stefanik, I mean, you know, I got some pushback on this for Twitter, but like I think she she was pretty effective as far as, you know, I think the Republicans are, are are on their heels a little bit as far as facts go for, for most of, of the this this hearing stuff, because a lot of what they're uh, what Rudy Giuliani was pushing was a conspiracy theory. But, you know, Stefanik is is raising her profile in a way that I have to think is pretty savvy down the line up until AOC. She was the youngest uh, member of Congress, woman in Congress. Um, and she's, you know, it reminds me a little bit of the way that Kamala Harris raised her profile with um, Trump confirmation hearings. Just, you know, the idea that when all eyes are on the television, it's good to be. It's a time to shine. It's a time to shine. So she certainly got that memo. Another big theme that is going to be discussed after the hearings from today is Trump's tweet in the middle of it all, in the middle of, in particular, the staff attorney for the Democrats asking Marie Yovanovitch questions, Trump tweeted this. Everywhere Marie Yovanovitch went turned bad. She started off in Somalia. How did that go? Then fast forward to Ukraine, where the new Ukrainian president spoke unfavorably about her in my second phone call with him. It is a it, it is a U.S. president's absolute right to appoint ambassadors. And this was threaded. So he goes on to say more, but we'll leave it at that. What was the result of this tweet? Perry. So the Democrat, so uh, Adam Schiff read the tweet in the hearing. Uh, then the ambassador uh, talked about it and kind of used that as part of her broader narrative that she did, um, having, having the pr- American president attack her sort of personally has been particularly damaging to her, you know, internally to her psyche. So she mentioned that. And the Republicans on the Hill, you know, when the reporters asked them, asked them sort of in between the different parts of the hearing, 
Republicans on the Hill were sort of nervous about what, what Trump did. Liz Cheney, who's usually pretty strong in defense, defending the party, said it wasn't a great idea to tweet that, tweet that out. Um, Schiff used the phrase witness intimidation and said that would be part of, potentially part of um, the impeachment charges. I thought this was a little overblown, I'll be honest with you. Donald Trump criticized somebody on Twitter who who is critical of him. You know, news at seven. Like, what was the, like? Nothing was surprising about that. Of course, Donald <laughs> Trump responded that way. Nothing was new about that at all to me. But that was, was just my view. I thought both sides kind of acted like something that was entirely predictable was interesting. That I found to be sort of, of course, he did that. It's interesting though, like the 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 live reading of the tweet and then getting her response because obviously she she hadn't seen the tweet because she was doing congressional testimony there was something novel about that and then he he elicited from her the i yes i i think the intent of that was to threaten me and and it's interesting because i think in some ways yovanovich was quite a was quite reluctant to talk in depth about how she felt right you know at one point she said well i don't really want i'm a private person i don't want to talk about the effect of this on my family um, you know, but, but being presented, like there was almost this, it was a, it was a good moment. It was almost like a, a gift, an own goal, um, you know, from Trump having tweeted that and then to the Democrats sort of being like, well, let's see what she has to say about that. And I think it's a, it was almost a, a public off guard moment and which I thought was interesting. Um, yeah, who knows if it's a witness tampering, but it certainly wasn't like a, um, a great moment because that's a good uh, that's a good little clip. I felt intimidated, you know, or th- that's a threat, or I felt threatened. The one other new thing that happened today was Trump released the uh, write up of his first phone call with President Zelensky. We already have the write up of his second phone call, which is the one that came out back in September, um, and he released that timed with the beginning of this hearing. What was the point of all that, Perry or Claire? What did we learn from that? Not, It's not a transcript. It says at the bottom of the page, you know, this is not a verbatim transcript. What was the point of releasing it now and what did we learn from it? So the call seemed like it was earlier in the Ukrainian pres- Ukrainian presidency's president's term. So it was earlier than that. They seem to have sort of a introductory call that was not particularly interesting. I guess if you wanted to show that Donald Trump is not always shaking down the Ukrainian president, it did illustrate that. So, I mean, it was a much more banal call. Our relationship um, is based on say more. It again? Our relationship is based on more. Yes. So, um, so in essence, um, it was not a particularly like Devin Nunes read the, from the call like it was a huge exoneration. And at some point, I was listening like he's just reading something. This has no impact, well, and no one came back to it because I think that call didn't tell. Even the other Republicans didn't think that call was exonerating. But my guess is the White House did. Yes, because they released the call right before the hearing. Nunes is close to them. He read it in sort of dramatic fashion, but. That was not particularly useful um, evidence, I don't think. Let me, and just to, I, uh, I screenshotted a headline earlier today from the, the Rupert Murdoch-owned uh, Daily Mail, and their headline about this transcript was, quote, White House releases transcript of first call between Trump and Ukrainian leader that shows President offered him White House visit with no strings attached and with no mention of Biden probe. So that's what apparently we were supposed to take from that. Although when this initial call happened, the readout of the call or the summary of the call that was made public, you know, they say, oh, President Trump spoke with President Zelensky this morning, et cetera. It said that he pushed the president of Ukraine, Trump did, on the issue of corruption. Obviously, it doesn't say corruption anywhere in that transcript or write up. What were they talking about? What when they released this readout saying he pushed Zelensky on corruption? I'm a little confused by this for two reasons. First, if a, a, I'm going to be rude here maybe and say, I think a, a more strategic White House would have maybe made sure that if the readout they put out said corruption, that the call they put out said corruption. So it wasn't easy to suggest they were sort of lying one of those two times. So that was one part. And the second part was I, I don't think the call was 
was incriminating at all. I, I just think it goes to the point. But I think the call in some ways actually proved the opposite point, which is that this, the Republicans are trying to argue Trump is singularly obsessed with corruption in Ukraine. That's what drove his actions. But the call just seems like it's a he, he could have called the president of any other country on some level with some of the things he said. It was like, visit the president, welcome, congratulations, you're going to do a great job. If you were really focused on corruption, Ukraine is the most corrupt country I can think of, and I have to press them. That call was not evidence of that. All right. Well, That's most of what happened today. But as we wrap up here, we did notice while we were all watching and live blogging about the hearings that NBC decided to cut away from them, uh, you know, before they were over, well before they were over. Does it seem like the networks that all tuned in and canceled their regularly scheduled programming this week will continue to do so through next week? I mean, I know we're not supposed to talk about the pizzazz level of these hearings, the media got criticized, particularly an NBC story got criticized for saying that there wasn't enough pizzazz on Wednesday. That's what I'm referring to. But how do we see the networks continuing to cover this? That's a good question. And, um, you know, it goes to, weirdly, it reminded me of, bear with me on this comparison, Apollo 13, the classic. I'm, <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. Take me there. The classic nine, both, both the famous, infamous, uh, failed trip to the moon and also the 90s movie starring Tom Hanks Such a which movie. which uh, talks about how there was originally supposed to be a broadcast from the space shuttle on national television and all the networks were supposed to carry it and there's this moment in the in the uh, film where they say they have to break it to the astronauts family that like well people are kind of bored by walking on the moon we've already done it so we're, the networks aren't going to run it and networks <laughs> <laughs> and networks are supposed to have this this duty in some sense is that they you know originally the those those three main networks were kind of given the airwaves right and they did they were there was an understanding that they did have a civic responsibility to say broad th- broadcast things like presidential debates or the resu- results of an election and so i think what you're you're seeing here with nbc being like eh, it's kind of boring um whether you agree with that or not is kind of that tension between wh- how do you balance like what's like the civic duty with like uh do people care about this anymore like we're here for the we're here for the ratings right it's also clear that most americans are going to consume this through the clips or this podcast right. or yeah. whatever it is like i don't think anybody actually expects that americans are watching five and a half hours of testimony on a daily basis during the work god i day. hope most of you aren't <laughs> just production like business capacity and production just went way down in america on this friday yeah Perry, what's your read on how the networks are covering this or just how the media in general is reacting to these impeachment hearings so far? So I would say two or three things. Um, I guess the first is that I do think it'll be different when a witness, I'm thinking of Gordon Sondland particularly, a witness who we think is very close to what happened and talked to Donald Trump about it. I do think that, I'm not going to predict every network covers it full scale, I do think that is a different magnitude of importance and potentially more interesting, candidly. And I do think that'll be covered differently. So I don't know if we should guess that the coverage will just go down from here, although I'm not sure. Maybe it will. But I do think that's a different hearing. The second part is... I'm not sure that it necessarily matters if 13 million or 9 million or 7 million or 3 million people watch these hearings. You know, either way, 300 million are not watching is what is something like that. So I think if a viral big moment happens in the hearings that we didn't expect and it becomes a big thing, I don't think it matters who is watching live or not. It'll become a big thing. I just don't know that we're going to have that moment in part because, you know, the three witnesses we have so far have pretty much said what they said in the private hearing and not much particularly different from that. And it looks like the witnesses the Democrats are going to call are are sort of these people who are diplomats who are very diplomatic and not very exciting. I don't think we're going to have like a Brett Brett Kavanaugh shouts into the microphone style moment the next few weeks. So I think that will limit the hearings interestingness as well. I just think these hearings might be dull and that will change things. Now, in terms of this debate in the media about how should the media cover the hearings and should the media just be very factual or should they cover them as a performance? I'm having a hard time with this question because 
I would argue that these hearings are important. The facts matter. We shouldn't diminish that. We shouldn't play theater critic. At the same time, hearings are a performance of sorts. So you have to think about it with that a little bit with that in your mind as well. It's interesting. It almost, Perry, while you were talking, it struck me that kind of what the Democrat, the congressional Democrats are facing is the same problem that like late night hosts face and Saturday Night Live faces, which is no one watches the full thing. They watch the clips on YouTube. And you're only going to watch it if there's something that someone says, oh, that's really funny. Or if, you know, you read the like the vulture recap of the funniest moments. And I think Sondland is he is not a career diplomat. He is a you know hotelier. He's a hotelier. And I think he's um, he's perhaps inclined to give a good quote. I was listening to the WNYC podcast about Trump, Trump, Trump Inc. And I think this is where I heard him um he was talking about the hotel business and he said something to the effect of, well, I love it. It's everything combined. It's restaurants, it's entertainment, it's sex. And I was like, well, someone who just, someone who at a, at a, like a industry conference describes the hotel business like that might give some good quotes at congressional testimony. I don't know. So like everyone tune in for Gordon Sondland. And that's going to be Wednesday morning. But to the point about just watching the clips, it also means that like both partisan outlets are going to get the content that they want and then they can air the clips that will kind of fire up their viewers accordingly they've which, already been doing that yeah. which you can see like watching these hearings all day long you kind of know when you see it like what's going to lead hannity tonight or like what's going to lead maddow tonight etc although it's troubling i think from a, a disinformation point of view i mean there was a moment on wednesday when Jim Jordan addressing Adam Schiff said, well, we all know that you are the only member of Congress, you know, Mr. Chairman Schiff, that knows the identity of the whistleblower. And directly after that, Adam Schiff says, let me correct correct the record. I do not know who the whistleblower is. But the clip that I saw uh, tweeted out by uh, Jordan's office and then by, I believe, the president, and so we'll make the rounds, is... Jordan saying, well, Schiff, you're the only one who knows who the whistleblower is and no one else does. You know, ostensibly not true, but that's the kind of thing that can come out of this, which is you don't get the the full story. And that is that is troubling just from a just from a person who uh, deals in facts. Right. Like, I do think that that's a problematic thing, although obviously I should note here, like everyone spins stuff. It's just that was particularly blatant that I saw that circulating. So the one thing I think about today that was worth saying is I actually think the Roger Stone conviction is probably a more important story than the ambassador's testimony. Ooh, there's the kind of 538 hot take we uh, come to this podcast for. But where's the data? (laughs) But where's the data? And I I say, I don't have any data, so I'm not going (laughs) to attend that. But uh, in the sense that I know we are, I know the, the Democrats and Pelosi have emphasized this impeachment is about this one phone call, this right. one quid pro quo, and we're proving that. In reality, I would argue the impeachment, Ukraine was the 19th event, and the first 18 were really led us to this point. And, and I think Roger Stone and the whole Mueller investigation kind of created the predicate for this. And then Ukraine was the final step. And they were like, we've got to impeach, and we're going to move forward on this. And I just generally think that when we look back upon this administration, the fact that his campaign chairman, one of his big advisors, like how many people on the Trump team in 2016 were indicted and and went to jail or went or, you know, were fined or what have you. That is ultimately a huge story and something that sticks with people in a way that I'm not sure, you know, that Trump was mean to an ambassador ultimately will. Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes to show that in the middle of the news cycle, as it's been in recent years, it's easy to lose track of everything that's going on. And yes, the fact that Roger Stone uh, was found guilty today is like not even going to lead the news because it's It's going to be the impeachment hearings that lead the news. By the way, cut this or keep this, but this just came across my Twitter transom and it's too good not to share. (laughs) Someone, Someone just tweeted this. In 2002, people named Donald Rumsfeld one of the sexiest men alive. CNN's Pentagon reporter called him, quote, 
a big flirty pussycat. <laughs> I saw this tweet earlier. I'm not sure where it came from. Or what caused Wait, is it to that come real out news? Can we fact check that before we I... decide to leave it in the podcast? <laughs> it's, it's. It's just, I'm looking at a screenshot which says People magazine at the top. CNN called him a virtual rock, rock star. Fox dubbed him a Beltway babe magnet. And the Wall Street Journal <laughs> hailed him as the new hunk of home front airtime. I mean, I don't know. Politics used to be more fun. <laughs> Although that was more fun for like six more months. 2002 got pretty serious pretty quickly. But anyway, yeah. Oh my God. A big flirty pussy cat. I just... <laughs> A little levity from 2002 when times were so much simpler. All right. It's Friday. Nobody email us complaining (laughs) that we're off topic. Anyway, with that, everyone have a great weekend. We will see you back on Monday and then for the rest of the week with these hearings and then the debate Wednesday night. Also, let me remind people that if you want 538 swag, which obviously you do, go to 538.com slash store. We've got some cool new designs on there for you to check out. But anyway... That's it for now. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, Galen. Thank you, Perry. Thanks, Galen. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the control room. Our intern is Jake Arlo. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or review in the Apple Podcast Store. I know I say that every time, but actually do it. Head over to the Apple Podcast Store. Give us a rating. We're doing a lot of podcasts for you. Anyway, or tell someone about the show. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.